to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ a philosophy that was popular in the days of Christ and is extremely popular today is this. Let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. This has long been the motto and philosophy of the Epicureans, and so many people adopt this materialistic, worldly-minded idea. One of the men in the Bible who did that was named Esau. Today we're going to talk about Esau and the bad bargain that he made. But as always, we want to encourage you to find your Bible and have that handy as we're going to study from these Old Testament lessons together. Friend, today's lesson is being brought to you by members of the Lord's Church. Those members of the Church of Christ in your area would love for you to visit their assemblies at their Bible study or their worship hour on Sunday or their Bible study on Wednesday. They'd love for you to stop by and visit with them to learn more about God and His plan of salvation. I'll promise you this. At the Lord's Church, you'll find people who love God, who give great reverence to the Word of God, and who are concerned about others as well. Here at the Gospel of Christ, our evangelistic work, we'd like to help you as well in your study of the Scripture. You can visit us on our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a, a host of free Bible study materials that will greatly benefit you in your study of the Word of God. We have uh, articles and, and DVDs and CDs and a lot of lessons that you can download. Just check those out if you would on our website. Uh, if you'd like to have a hard copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, both on video or audio, you can go to our website and fill out a media request form, or you can write to us or call us, and we'd be glad to help you in any way as you strive to live your life in harmony with the will of God. We mentioned a man by the name of Esau. Esau will always be remembered for his bad bargain, his desire for immediate instant gratification, and for embodying the motto, the motto let us eat, Drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. I want us to take just a moment, and I want, to, I want you to read with me the story of Esau, and then we're going to notice some very powerful lessons that men and women can learn from that. Genesis chapter 25 is our text, and I'd like for you to follow along, beginning in verse number 20. The Scripture records these words. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as wife the daughter of Bethuel the Syrian of Padam Aran, the sister of Laban the Syrian. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah his wife conceived. But the children struggled together within her. And she said, If all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over, so they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a mild man, dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now Jacob cooked a stew. And Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, 
Please feed me with the same uh, red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, Look, I am about to die. What is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, Swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank and arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. As we mentioned, nobody better exemplifies the instant gratification and the, the giving away of something important than Esau. The story of Jacob and Esau relates to us. The struggle of, of these two men, but, but some of it is a little maybe unique to us because of the idea of the birthright. The birthright under the Old Testament is something we're not as familiar with, but it was a great blessing given to the firstborn to carry on the heritage of the father. Here's what it included. The Old Testament birthright, which was only given to the firstborn male of the father, was a double portion of the father's inheritance that was promised to that child. According to Deuteronomy 21, verses 15 through 17, the firstborn got two-thirds. If there were two children, he'd get two-thirds, and the other would get one-third. And so it wasn't split 50-50. He got the majority of everything that belonged to the father. But also, we learn from the Old Testament Scripture that it was the firstborn who had the privilege of serving as priest for the family. This is exemplified under the patriarchal law in the life of Abraham. Abraham served as uh, one who went to God, one on behalf of his own family. And of course, Job exemplifies this as well. He offered sacrifice for his children. God spoke directly to Job. There was that great blessing that came along with uh, being the firstborn as well. Then, of course, there was a great deal of respect respect, recognition, and honor was given to the firstborn uh, regardless of who uh, the father may have been. That was always along with that right. There was almost a sense of, of awe and reverence that was paid to the firstborn that might not have been given to the other children. Then the spiritual blessing as well of the father was placed upon the firstborn. Genesis chapter 27 verse 27, we can see that happening with both uh, Jacob and Isaac and the, the children there. This, in fact, this may have been what was sought after the most, passing on that spiritual blessing given by God. Then, of course, anything the Bible says, anything that was the firstborn, the first fruits of the harvest, the firstborn of, a, uh, of the flock, that was specially dedicated to the service of God. Exodus 22, verses 29 through 31. And so to be the firstborn under the Old Testament was a great privilege and honor. And friend, as you think about that, that, that New Testament law that we're under today, there's so many similarities that go along with that and parallels that Christians have. All Christians today have the blessing and the benefit of being a child of God and that wonderful birthright. Jesus said in Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Jesus said you'll find rest for your souls as children of God. We are God's firstborn. We are the first fruits of Christ. 1 Timothy 2, verses 4 through 6. And friend, just like under the Old Testament, there are some parallels to the wonderful blessings that Christians have today as part of their birthright. Christians are promised a full portion of what God has given to His people. We, like Esau, who received the greater portion, Christians today as God's children, we have that full portion of heaven itself. Romans 8, verse 16 and 17, the Bible clearly teaches that we are the beneficiaries of God's promises of heaven itself. We're living in hope of eternal life. 
which God who cannot lie promised before time began. This is the promise He's promised us eternal life. 1 John chapter 2 verse number 25. And so I'm not looking for land. I'm not looking for uh, numbers or dollars in a bank account. As a child of God, part of the great blessing we have is one day we can be recipients of heaven and all the wonder and splendor of that. But you know, as we think about this idea in relation to the Old Testament birthright, aren't Christians today priest in a spiritual sense revelation 1 verse 6 we are a kingdom of priests or kings and priests to god first peter 2 verse 9 we offer up spiritual sacrifices to almighty god and so when we think about this idea our, our the praise of our lips goes up as sacrifice hebrews 13 verse 15 we have that honor today along with our birthright to give praise and honor to God and to serve in that capacity. And then, of course, just as the Old Testament birthright meant that you wore the, the name and the honor and recognition of being the firstborn of someone, friend, we today have the privilege and honor of wearing the name Christian, the firstborn of God's creation under the New Testament. What a blessing that is. Acts 11 verse 26 says they were called Christians first in Antioch. 1 Peter 4 16, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this name. And then my friend, like under the Old Testament, part of the spiritual birthright today is we are promised every spiritual blessing from Almighty God. The Old Testament birthright meant that there were a host of blessings uh, given down by the Father, and it was even tied in a spiritual sense. But how much more today? Every spiritual blessing is ours in Christ Jesus. I can be a child of God. 1 John 3 verse 1, I can look up to heaven and pray. Our Father who art in heaven, Matthew 6 verse 9, we have the family of God to encourage and lift us up. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 27, we've got forgiveness, grace, mercy, love, every blessing you can imagine. The Christian has so richly received. And like under the Old Testament, as part of my birthright, I am and you are. If you're a Christian, you are specially reserved and dedicated in service to God. What's the greatest commandment of all? Jesus was asked that question. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's what God wants us to do, and that's how He wants us to live our life in dedication to Him. Now, in view of that, though, I want you to think about Esau. And I want you to think about the great blessing of our birthright today as Christians and then think about what Esau sold out. Can you imagine for a bowl of beans, Esau sold his whole birthright, two-thirds of the inheritance, the prestige, the honor, the spiritual blessing, the, uh, the seed working its way, all of that he sold out for a bowl of beans. Why did he do that? Well, he may have been hungry. I'm sure he was. He'd been out hunting. He didn't have any luck. Uh, maybe he'd fallen on hard times. Maybe he was discouraged. But you know what we learn about Esau most of all? Esau was shallow. He was very materialistic. And he was worldly focused. He, the Bible says in Hebrews 12 verses 14 through 17 that Esau was profane. That is, he was worldly, selfishly, immorally focused. Sold out his whole birthright for a bowl of soup or a bowl of beans. What a terrible waste and a ter what a terrible bargain um, that he gave into his brother to do that. Friend, this would, be, this would be like someone of amazing wealth today. This would be like Bill Gates or, or Ross Perot giving everything he had for a Big Mac. Can you imagine selling out like that just to satisfy instant gratification for your belly? Why did he do that? He wasn't thinking spiritually. He was thinking worldly. But friend, let's take it a step further. 
Why do so many Christians and so many people who have all those spiritual birthrights and blessings that we talk about, why do so many Christians today sell their birthright for immediate gratification and lust of the flesh? which is one day isn't going to amount to anything. How many people have given up Christ and been lost for eternity over some fleshly desire, uh, instant gratification, whether it be of a fleshly, a sexual, a moral desire? How many people have given up something far greater than what Esau gave up on just to feel better for a little while? Are we really any different than Esau today? Why do sometimes people sell their soul to the devil for foolish things? I want you to think about some of the things that sometimes people make a bad bargain to the devil for their soul. Sometimes people sell out and give up on all these spiritual blessings over worldliness and materialism and things of this life that one day aren't going to exist anyway. John said, do not love the world or the things in the world. Why not? For all that is in the world, lust the flesh, lust the eyes, and the pride of life. It's not of the Father, it's of the evil one. And the world and all that's in it is one day going to pass away. James 4 verse 4, James said, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore desires to be a friend of the world makes himself God's enemy. God says, Come out from among them and be ye separate. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17 and 18. But how many people do we know that have sold out for things of this world? Let me give you a couple that really come to mind in the Scripture. Do you remember a man who came to Jesus in Mark chapter 10? This man probably had one of the greatest questions you could ever ask. Good teacher. What do I need to do to go to heaven? What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Great question. Wish there were more people asking that question. Jesus said, keep the commandments. Do not murder, do not steal, do not commit adultery. All these I've done from my childhood. One thing you lacked. Sell what you have. Give to the poor. Come follow me. You know what happened in that context? The Bible says that man went away sorrowful. Why? He had great possessions. He let his stuff and the things of this world keep him from inheriting that spiritual birthright. Friend, how many people are doing that today? Got to have nice homes. Got to have nice cars. We've got to have the finer things in life. We've got to keep up with the Joneses. And we've got to have all this materialistic stuff, worldly stuff, that one day isn't going to matter at all when the earth and all that's in it is one day burned up with a fervent heat, 2 Peter 3, verses 9 through 12, then what will all that stuff have mattered? Don't do like Esau and sell out over materialism and worldliness. Then there are also people who spiritually sell out their birthright for desires of the flesh. Specifically, sometimes people do that for sexual desires. Uh, I've known Christians and people in the body of Christ, and you probably have as well, who got caught up in some immoral practice with some woman or some man or pornography or whatever it may be, and they sold out over those things. The Bible clearly warns us to watch out for those things. 1 Peter 2 verse 11, Peter said, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. The Hebrew writer said in Hebrews 13, 4, marriage is honorable and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Flee youthful lust. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, verse 15 following. And friend, I've got to have that same armor up, that same guard up. Don't give in like Esau to some instant, immediate gratification of the flesh and lose your birthright over that. Then sometimes people allow sins of the body or sins against the body to cause them to lose their birthright. Alcohol and drugs and drunkenness. How many people have given into that 
and sold out spiritually. The Bible says, do not be drunken with wine. Ephesians 5.18, the word there, methuo, drunken, means don't even start the process of getting involved in that. Uh, wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler. Proverbs 20, verse 1. Uh, the picture is so clear in Scripture of how harmful that is to the body. Drugs, methamphetamines, uh, marijuana, crack, cocaine, whatever it may be. When people get caught up in that stuff. Alcohol, they're selling out. They're selling over their birthright, just as Esau did, for something that isn't really going to last anyway. And so we encourage folks today, as we think about these ideas, and as we think about the spiritual nature of Esau, don't, don't be like him. What if Esau had been different? What if he'd stood up to his brother? What if he'd endured those temptations? My well, friend, the story would be a whole lot different. And here's the encouragement for every one of us today. Friend, you can stay faithful. You can endure those challenges and you can be faithful until death. D don't let things in this life tempt you in such a way that it causes you to turn from Almighty God. You know, I, I've had some things in this life, some good things to eat. Uh, you think about what Esau was going through. He was hungry. He was facing a lot of challenges and difficulties probably. Things weren't going his way in life. And that, that, that bowl of soup, that bowl of lentils or beans, boy, it just really looked good in the moment. My grandmother, uh, on my dad's side, probably made the best bowl of beans I've ever eaten. Now, I'd sure like to have a bowl of beans and cornbread right now. And I imagine you'd probably think the same thing. If you were really hungry, if you were having a hard time in life, Seeing that and having that immediate gratification, that'd be really good. But the question you've got to ask yourself is this. Is that worth what it'll really cost me in the end? I'm not talking about a bowl of beans. I'm talking about giving in to materialism, fleshly desires, giving in to uh, drugs or alcohol or something like under that. Getting that immediate hit. Is that really worth? What is going to cost me in the end? I want you to think about this question Jesus asked. Mark chapter 8, verse 36 and 37. Jesus asked two uh, rhetorical questions, questions of which the answer is immediately obvious. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? If you bargain your soul over something like that, friend, you've made the worst bargain possible. On the day of judgment, you're not going to trade something for your soul. If I've not lived right or done right, it won't matter how powerful or wealthy or how many pleasures I might have fulfilled or how many skins you've got on the wall. None of that matters. You know what matters? Did I love God? Did I put Him first? Did I endure suffering? And did I overcome? Those are the things that really matter. Now, I want you to think about a man in the Bible with me. We're going to think about two men. One represents another bad bargain, and the other represents a man who suffered and did right. I want you to think about this first individual with me. We know him in the Bible as the rich fool. Luke chapter 12, verse 15 through 21. Uh, a, a lawyer comes to Jesus with a, a question. Jesus answers by giving an illustration of the foolishness of materialism. There was a man who had a great crop year. A man who, when he planted his seed, it just did so well, and he excelled so much in his business that he didn't have anywhere to put all the crop that produced. And so that's a pretty good problem, right? So he said, here's what I'll do. I've got so much crop, I'm going to have to tear down my old barns, build bigger barns so I can store it in. Nothing wrong with business, nothing wrong with having a good crop year, nothing wrong with preparing for the future. All that was good and well until this happened. That night, that man's soul was required of him. And then God said to him, You fool, this night will your soul be required of you. Then whose things will those be? whom you've acquired. And here's the point Jesus made. So is he who is rich, but not toward or in godliness. What was the rich fool's problem? His problem was not that he was a good farmer. His problem was not that he was a good planner, a good manager, a good business person. That man's problem was 
in all his planning, all his doing, and all his work, he forgot to take care of the most important thing. He left his soul unprepared. And then think about another man. Luke chapter 16, verse 19 through 31. You've got the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Rich man had it all. Lazarus is eating crumbs. The dogs are licking his sores. He doesn't have anything. He's a poor beggar. Lazarus suffered. He had difficulty. He went through a lot of problems, most likely in this life, and he was hungry and hurting for a long time, maybe even. What about on the other side? Lazarus turned out pretty good for him. He's in paradise. The rich man's in torment. He endured. He didn't let that cause him to sell out. He may have been poor physically, but he was rich spiritually. Friend, that's what we want to drive home. Don't be like Esau. Don't sell out whatever we've got spiritually, what God has blessed us with. Don't sell that out for some fleshly, immediate, instant gratification that could cost you your soul. Nothing is more important than your soul. Make sure that we're taking care of it above all else. Friend, if you're not a Christian, we especially want to encourage you to make sure to get right with God. Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do you believe He is the Savior of the world? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by Him. Do you believe that? John 14, verse 6. Do you believe it so much so that you'd be willing to repent and turn from sin and turn to God? Acts 3, verse 19. Peter preached, repent and turn that your sins may be blotted out. Would you confess the beautiful name of Jesus before me in Romans 10, verse 10? And would you do what Jesus said to be saved? Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. If you've never obeyed the gospel, then friend, we want to encourage you to make the spiritual birthright of Christ yours. As a Christian, if you're not living like you ought to, friend, don't sell out your soul. Make sure and get it right and let each one of us live in such a way that our lives bring honor and glory to God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.